Hello class, we are ready to start our week three, lecture B. So our second lecture for the week will be over confirmation. I know that I said this in basic equitation if you're a crossover student, but when we're looking at the horse's confirmation, their way of travel, confirmation for performance and for functionality, this could be an entire course in itself. So I don't want to overload you with information or overwhelm you with information. However, I do want to provide a broad overview of confirmation and what we're looking for in a desirable horse and then also a couple of confirmation flaws in the equine athlete. That being said, I will try to keep this week's lecture fairly short per se. And at the completion of you watching this lecture, I'm also going to post a or attach a podcast link. The podcast is from a professor at the New Mexico State University that is a equine extension specialist. And they go over evaluating stock type confirmation. I really like the examples that he uses in analyzing and evaluating a horse. So that being said, I think his little 15-minute podcast is very beneficial to getting a concise overview of confirmation in the horse. We began this week talking about anatomy, and I like to think that anatomy flows directly into confirmation, keeping these two lectures paired together. Um, anatomy as it relates to function. A discussion of confirmation is a study in anatomy and its relation to the function of each structure. Although various parts of a horse are isolated, scrutinized, and analyzed for their individual contribution to the abilities of that animal, each part influences the others as an interactive system. The interaction of muscles and tendons generates locomotion. Think of the individual muscle units as levers and pulleys moving different parts of the skeleton about. The way the skeleton is put together is known as the conformation and determines the strength and the coordination of the individual muscles. While different sports capitalize on strengthening some parts of a horse's body more than others, basic conformation principles apply in evaluating any equine athlete. You will hear me say time and time again that good conformation is good conformation. To define confirmation, confirmation is the physical appearance of an animal due to the arrangement of muscle, bone structure, and other bodily tissue. The five different qualities that we would be analyzing when considering confirmation include balance, structure and travel, muscle, quality, and then breed and sex characteristics. These are the Five key characteristics that the American Quarter Horse Association breaks out that we need to be sure we're analyzing when looking at a confirmation class of horses. As we strive for competitive excellence in a chosen equine sport, we are dependent on the talent of our equine partner. Talent drives, drives from many factors, not the least of which is the conformational structure of the horse. Without the physical ability to perform in a particular discipline, no amount of mental desire or fitness can bring a horse to the leading edge. The ideal horse is an image to which we compare all others. There is no such thing as a perfect horse, but a horse with good confirmation makes a durable athlete. Excellent confirmation does not always guarantee excellence in performance. Other talents, such as temperament and trained abilities, are necessary to create a superior athlete. Each horse has strengths and weaknesses in different areas, both physically and mentally. Ideal confirmation is a debatable issue in the equine industry, but there is one thing that we all seem to agree on. It is difficult to find the ideal horse. It is said that the one horse that has come closest to meeting the imagery embodied of the ideal horse was Secretariat. If you recall our first week of lecture, we talked about Secretariat 
as a horse in history that has largely influenced the thoroughbred breed. His body build and proportions meet all the specifications for excellence and performance in just about any riding discipline. A horse with excellent conformation is well suited to perform a variety of tasks and is not just regulated to performing as one kind of sport horse. Our objective then is to figure out what makes a versatile equine athlete. Many equine sports share some common threads. These include the horse needs to develop self-carriage and balance. He should be able to lighten his forehand and shift his center of gravity toward his rear haunches to distribute weight more equally between the front and rear. And this lends agility to his movement while imparting the potential for power and burst of speed. Depending on the particular sport, the haunches will assume varying amounts of load. Along with strong, strong haunches, many equine athletes require a strong back that well couples the fore and rear quarters. Before we get too far into confirmation, I wanted to provide you all with a couple of terms that I wanted to make sure you're familiar with and you can define. The unsoundness versus a blemish in a horse. And unsoundness is defined as any deviation in form or function that interferes with the individual's usefulness. So if a horse has an unsoundness, it's going to hurt them conformationally. It's something we want to make note of um, to steer clear of. However, a blemish is an abnormality which may detract from an animal's appearance but does not affect its serviceability. An example of a blemish could be a wire cut, a rope burn, a shoe broil, or capped hawks. So a blemish is not going to affect the serviceability, but it may make the horse appear um, appearance not as ideal. So a blemish is not something that we're going to want to count off for in confirmation. Now we're ready to start with balance, which is the first component that we will be analyzing when looking at a horse's conformation. Prior to analyzing balance or looking at conformation, it's important that you can identify the basics of horse anatomy and that you can also describe common coat colors and markings as this is important when we're evaluating and judging horses. When looking at balance, balance is one of the most important selection criteria, but it is sometimes the most difficult to comprehend or visualize. It is determined as the way a horse's parts fit together to form the whole or the blending of the parts to form the entire horse. Balance is evaluated from the side view about 25 to 30 feet away from the horse. Each of the following parts of the horse will be critically evaluated to determine a horse's balance. This includes the top line, the back, the croup and hip, the heart girth, the shoulder, as well as the neck. Starting with the overall balance of the horse, one should be able to divide the horse into three equal parts. So this is shown by our red lines in the diagram or photograph shown below. So we can divide our horse into three equal parts where we have their shoulder, their midsection, and their hindquarters. Um, visualizing this in our head can help provide a starting point in evaluating balance. So asking yourself, are these three sections the same size? Which portion is the smallest? And which portion is the largest? The answers to these questions can help you break down the exact parts of the horse to determine balance. Um, for example, if the middle section is the largest, the horse may have a long back in comparison to the rest of his body. So evaluating the horse in thirds gives you a really good starting point when evaluating balance. When evaluating the horse's top line, it should represent one continuous line starting at the pole and extending to the tail head. It is essential that you look for smoothness of the top line and overall connectivity. The back lies from the withers to the loin 
and should be strong and relatively short compared to the underline. So this is going to be our top line to our underline ratio. The trapezoid drawn on our horse here, the top of that is going to be our top line. The bottom portion is going to be our underline. So our top line to our underline ratio. Horses with long, well-sloped shoulders will often give the impression of being short in their backs. A short back will be more capable of withstanding the weight of the rider and equipment, and then with mares will provide more strength and support when they are carrying a foal. A long underline will permit a longer stride, resulting in greater efficiency of movement. As long backs may appear strong in younger horses, they will weaken with age and use, leaving a horse sway back. So next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about back conformation, looking at sway-backed and long-back horses. As part of the top line, the croup should be smooth and strong. So we're looking at the hind quarters. A short, steep croup should be faulted because it shortens a horse's stride. The angle of the hip extends from the point of the hip to the point of the buttocks and should be a 65-degree angle. So the green line on the hind quarters of our horse that's going to extend from the point of the hip to the point of the buttocks should be a 65 degree angle. This will help the horse's stride length and overall quality of movement. Then from the hind quarters and the croup, we'll begin looking at the shoulder. So the shoulder length and slope are extremely important as horses with long, well-sloped, well-laden shoulders will have a wider range of motion and will give a smoother ride. They will develop less unsoundness in the forelegs, and this slope should be a 45-degree angle from the point of the shoulder to the top of the withers. So this is shown on the green line on the forequarters of our horse. So a 45-degree angle from the point of the shoulder to the top of the withers. Both the length and slope of the shoulder are evaluated by visualizing the scapula spine. So a longer shoulder will permit a greater range of motion by allowing for greater muscular contraction. Since the shoulder bone and the arm bone work together as part of the shock absorbing mechanism, it is clear that a well sloped shoulder will permit more cushion, more cushion or absorption of forces during movement than a short steep shoulder will. In addition to length and slope, the shoulder should blend well or be well laid into both the neck and the barrel. And uniquely, the length of neck is also important because the horse uses its neck and weight of its head as a counterbalance to maintain equilibrium during movement. The longer the neck, the more leverage the horse will have while executing maneuvers. An example of this is a hunter horse will raise its head and neck just before taking a jump and a cutting horse will bend its neck and orient its head just before changing direction. And the reining horse will raise its head and neck during a sliding stop. In addition to length, the neck should tie high into the chest, improving the horse's overall ability to balance. So all of this being said in describing balance, and yes, we do want to visualize these different components, and we want to look for correct angles, and we want to look for flow and tying in well. However, I think a lot of times when we're looking at conformation of horses, we overanalyze. And the more you look at a horse, I could start picking apart negatives. A lot of times the first glance, the first visual opinion that you form on a horse is more right than you think. So going with your first instinct is not always a negative thing when looking at conformation and balance. Oftentimes my first instinct and my first glance is going to be more accurate than picking this horse apart over and over again. When talking about balance, we did look at the horse's top line and their back so this diagram is just to give you a visual of our horse's ideal back in the upper left hand corner, a horse that may be long backed in the lower right hand corner. And then I think that easily flows up into our upper right where we see a horse that is sway backed, a horse that is long backed 
as they age and as they are used and their bodies take wear and tear, horses with a long back will age to have a sway back over time. And then on our bottom left hand, we have a horse that is roach backed. So a horse that is, uh, they have a raised back. They're hunched up in their back. So that's going to be a roach backed horse. When evaluating structure and travel, it is evaluated from the side view as well as the front and rear views. For the horse to perform properly, it must have sound feet and legs. From the side view, you should be able to draw a straight line from the shoulder down the front of the knee, the cannon bone, and hoof in the front, as shown in image A below. The horse's feet should be tough, well-rounded, and roomy with deep open heels. They should be set directly under the knees and hocks and should be straight when viewed from the front and rear. The legs should be straight and the knees and hocks should be deep, wide, and free from coarseness. The bones should appear flat and be clean, hard, and free from puffiness, and it should be of adequate strength and substance to properly support the horse during strenuous activities, and tendons should be well-defined. Horses should be serviceably sound, as young animals should show no defects in conformation that may lead to unsoundness. Moving into B in our diagram, this is a horse that the pastern is too straight. So you can see that line that we're dropping from the shoulder through the knee and the cannon bone. That instead of landing slightly behind the heel of the hoof, that we're landing midway up. So this is going to be a horse that the pastern is too straight. See, we have a weak pastern or a pastern that is too long. So that straight line, instead of running, as we said, an A ever so slightly behind the hill, we're actually landing further behind the hill than we should be. And you can see the angle at which the horse's hoof is set is it does not look comfortable nor natural. In D, we have a horse that is calf kneed. Um, calf kneed we can view when viewing from the side, and these horses are going to break backwards at the knee. So their knee is going to be further set back than ideal. Moving to E, we have buck knees. Again, this is when the horse is over at the knees. When a horse is over at the knees or has knees that protrude too far forward when viewing from the side, buck knees are not considered a severe fault as the opposite condition of calf knee. And then on F, we have a horse that is fine boned. So you can see looking down the cannon that this cannon bone is very fine and slender comparative to the rest of our horse's leg. When viewing a horse from the side view for the hind quarters, we should be able to draw a straight line down the hock, the cannon bone, and then the back of the hoof. So on the far left hand side we have a ideal view of the horse's hind leg from the side. Moving to the right, we then have a horse that is sickle hocked. This is when a horse's rear legs have too much set to the hocks, and when viewing from the side, it will resemble a sickle. Our third horse over from the left, we have a horse that is camped out behind. When viewing the rear legs, they are set out behind the back of the hip. This usually starts at the hocks and continues down the lower legs. So we can see this horse appears to have a stretched out view, so they are camped out behind. And then finally, our fourth photograph on the right hand side, or diagram on the right hand side, we have a horse that his leg is too straight, so it's going to be very straight up and down comparative to ideal. Next, we will be evaluating the horse's structure from the front and hind view. 
When the horse is facing forward or away from you, a line should be drawn from the point of the shoulder or buttocks down through the knee or hock, the cannon bone, and then through the middle of the hoof. As we can see, the horse labeled A in the diagram is going to be correct or ideal. Then for B, we have a horse that is splay-footed or toed out. This is when the horse stands with the toes of its front legs turned outward. This horse will wing when moving, which is when the striding foot swings inward toward the supporting leg when traveling. Moving to C, we have a horse that is pigeon-toed or toed in, and this is when a horse appears to be standing with the, with the hoof turned toward the center of the body, and such a horse commonly exhibits paddling as a result of this condition. For D, we have a horse that is knock-kneed, this is when a horse stands in at the knees or too close at the knees. Knock need is considered a condition caused by the bones of the upper and lower leg not entering and leaving the knee squarely. And we finish up this diagram of forelimb structure from the front view with a horse that is base narrow and base wide. So a horse that is base narrow is going to stand with their forelimbs close together, and a horse that is base wide is going to stand wider in the forelimbs than they should, ideally. And finally, we will evaluate structure of the hind limb from the rear view. We start this, di we start this diagram on the left-hand side with our ideal horse, so they're going to have a straight line running through the hawk, the cannon and through the center of the hoof. We then move into a horse that is base wide. So again, a horse that is going to stand wider than ideal at the hind limb. And then base narrow. So a horse that stands very close in the hind quarters. Following that, we have a horse that is bow legged or bandy legged. A bow legged horse is when a horse stands pigeon toed on its hind feet with the points of its hocks turned outward. This horse is said to stand bow-legged behind. Such horses go wide at the hocks, making collected performance impossible, and a horse should work with his hocks fairly close together and not wide apart. So this horse is not going to perform ideally in performance events normally. It's not what we're going to expect. And then on the far right-hand side, we have a horse that is cow-hocked. When a horse stands with the point of the hocks turned inward while being base wide and splay footed. So a lot going on with our horse that is cow hocked. After we've evaluated balance and then structure and travel, we're ready to finish the three final evaluations of conformation, muscle, quality, and breed and sex characteristics. I do want to give you a broad overview of these, but we're not going to go in detail on them. So, that being said, muscle is important as all movement originates from the contraction and relaxation of muscles. The horse depends on muscles for a variety of functions of locomotion, to move food through its digestive system, to run its heart, and even to move certain parts of its body to chase away flies. Because the, clean is, because the horse is a performance tool, it is evaluated for the muscling response for locomotion. As for quality, um, different breed associations will view quality differently. Some put a strong emphasis on quality in judging horses. However, few quality factors are actually going to affect the horse's function, serviceability, and athletic potential. Um, still, quality is important and must be considered in our total evaluation. Quality is a combination of the skin, the hair coat, the head, the throat latch, the feet, as well as the bone structure. A horse that is high quality has a smooth, short hair coat and thin, 
pliable skin. On the head, the ears are relatively short and erect. The face is short and displays width between the eyes, tapering to a fine muzzle. The eyes are prominent and located on the corners of the face to permit a greater range of vision, and the head has very little excessive tissue, and the skin fits closely to the head, with definition of skull shape and observable blood vessels. In the throat latch, horses are clean and refined. This will allow more flexibility at the pole and will enable the horse to maintain a proper headset when being ridden. So that's just a, a little bit about quality and what you would be evaluating in that area. And then we have our breed and sex characteristics. Breed and sex characteristics can be evaluated by looking at the head of the horse. Stallions and gildings should express a certain degree of masculinity about the head, including a thicker jaw and larger head overall, whereas a mare should exhibit a greater degree of femininity, including a smaller refined features. In addition, certain breeds of horses carry more muscle than others. For example, quarter horses are heavier muscled compared to the lighter muscled Arabian horses, and a heavy muscled Arabian horse carrying more weight may not be suitable to its purpose, such as endurance racing. So prior to purchasing or evaluating or judging a horse based on confirmation, we want to make sure that we are familiar with the breed standard. That being said, I know I reference the quarter horse and stock type horses a lot because that is what we primarily have here at Western's Farm, but also because that's what I grew up with. That's what I'm most familiar with. That's what a lot of my research and teaching was in. Um, however, that's not to say that confirmation isn't similar across different breeds and different disciplines. It's just that there is going to be that variation in breed characteristics. So an example would be the Tennessee walking horse. This is their statement um, within their breed. So this is their breed characteristics that they're looking for. The walking horse should have a intelligent and neat head, well-shaped and pointed ears, clear and alert eyes, and a tapered muzzle. The horse may be thicker through the throat latch and the, and the neck should tie deep into the chest with a vertical appearance. The shoulders should be muscular and sloping into a short, strong back with good coupling at the loins. The croup is generally more sloping or steep than in other breeds due to the walking horse's stride. The breed's natural overstride makes it desirable to have some set to the hocks so that the horse appears slightly sickle hocked from the side and towed out from the rear views. So that's just an, that's just an example of how breed characteristics can be different from breed to breed. If you think back, I was going to say if you think back to us covering breeds, but that was basic ek, so we haven't done that in this class. Um, but breed characteristics will vary from breed to breed. And that being said, I'll go ahead and conclude this, conclude this lecture on confirmation. So we're getting ready to hit that 30-minute mark. Um, so this will give you a little time that you will still be able to go and view the podcast that I mentioned earlier. Um, the podcast is Evaluating Stock Type Confirmation. It is an extension horse resource for youth and was made possible through the New Mexico State University. I've included a photograph of, of the title page or the display you'll see in the podcast. I will also attempt to post a link in Blackboard. So after you've been able to go through and watch that podcast, then you'll be ready to complete week 3B assignment. So this will be your final assignment for week 3. In stating that, I know week four will be having an exam coming up. And as soon as I get that exam further developed, then I will make you all aware um, on approximately how many questions and how that will be set up in Blackboard. So make sure that you're taking time to watch these lectures and understand the content covered, but also that you're spending a little time studying and reviewing this material.